Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dan Beller from Johns Hopkins, um, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him, Dan, um, continue. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, it is a great pleasure to, uh, th th despite having to uh, follow on the heels of a really, really fascinating talk, uh, I um, hope I can uh, follow up on that act with a very different perspective uh trying to put together soft matter and active matter with um a population genetics statistical perspective so the title i have here is do active pneumatic self-mixing dynamics help growing bacterial colonies to maintain local genetic diversity um, so everything i'll tell you about in this talk uh was the work of fabian jan schwarzendahl who um, was a postdoc uh, with me and with Kinjal Daspiswas at UC Merced. Uh, he is now at Dusseldorf. Um, I'm now at Johns Hopkins. And um, I'm going to mainly talk about bacteria, but also talk a little bit about microtubules. So, um, but which, like the actin filaments we just heard about, are from the eukaryotic cells. All of it is going to be about active liquid crystals of these elongated objects, whether bacteria or, um, or microtubules. Uh, and so from a materials perspective, from a symmetry perspective, um, I like to start with this categorization uh, by Christina Marchetti and co-authors of the symmetry of the, orient the orientational symmetry of the active system where if for the schools of fish or flocks of birds at the macro scale, we're typically thinking about clearly polar objects uh, and also an emergent polar um, uh, active material, right? It's moving in some direction. Um, and at the micro scale, you can get such flocking behavior, but you can also get active pneumatics of self-propelled objects. I don't know how well the movie will show up over Zoom, but these rod-shaped bacteria here are each self-propelling forward, but they are, they're equal numbers going northeast as southwest. Um, and this third class on the right is where you have this same uh, pneumatic order emerging at the macro scale, but from the micro scale, uh, it had that symmetry to begin with and a, um, a model system for these uh, active pneumatics has been uh, created by the Dogic lab and used now by several other groups um, consisting of microtubules in vitro along with kinesin, which is one of the main motor proteins that will walk along them. And here there's a streptavidin uh, linker molecule such that the kinesins will slide bundles of microtubules against each other. And so that active force generation has this head tail symmetry, equal forces left and right. And the emergent material dynamics are the movie on the right, um, where there's clearly orientational order. Here it's the microtubules fluorescently tagged. Um, but you see that the order only has a finite range and there are these um, interruptions to that order, which I'll talk about uh, today, uh, which are defects in the liquid crystal. So the first section is going to be a brief advertisement um, for part of, of this work on microtubules in an in vitro gliding assay. Uh, and the second will focus on growing bacterial colonies and um, consequences of this active pneumatic physics um, that may be uh, consequential in vivo at the population scale. So starting with these microtubules, the geometry we're talking about here um, is dense microtubule gliding assays. Uh, so microtubules are placed on top of a, um, a, lay, a supported lipid bilayer with kinesin motors on top of it. Um, typically, a gliding assay like this will have, the, will have the kinesin sitting on the glass slide and stuck in place. Uh, but Linda Hurst, her lab and uh, some others in the field have started um, modifying this so that the kinesins can move around uh, and diffuse through this lipid bilayer underneath. Uh, we're interested in the collective dynamics that emerge when the kinesins pushing these filaments along um, will push them into each other. And so they sort of sterically interact, although they do sometimes cross over. And in this movie where the filaments are colored by orientation, we see an initially isotropic disordered state 
develop into local pneumatic order over time. These are what we call pneumatic lanes. One of the main ones you'll see um, nearly along the east-west axis uh, in the center of the movie, right around here, if you can see my mouse. And then there are several of these lanes. And actually several different um, phases to observe depending on uh, how many filaments there are, so the density of filaments, or um, the ATP concentration powering the kinesin uh, can slow down or speed up the filaments effectively. So as you increase the density of filaments or slow them down with less ATP, you tend to go from the disordered active isotropic phase to a uniformly ordered global active pneumatic phase with two intermediate states, one of which is the pneumatic lanes I'm showing on the left, and the other one is a coexistence phase uh, where there is a global pneumatic order, but this very non-uniform density that we see associated with these local lane formations. Uh, and one key piece of this, and this is where the work of, of Fabia on the postdoc uh, uh, was critical, is understanding the effects of the motors being diffusive as opposed to stuck in place on this system. Um, which turns out to be a little bit subtle. Um, so Fabian developed this hydrodynamic numerical framework uh, where we're simulating not only the pneumatic lanes, but also the uh, concentration of motors um, as a separate concentration field. And the pneumatic, uh, the microtubules forming the pneumatic lanes have a uh, polarity field as well as a pneumatic uh, tensor order parameter field. Um, and what's happening is the motors are diffusing, so you'll see that happening in the right movie, but they're only diffusing while they're unbound, and they're only pushing the motor, they're only pushing the filaments, microtubules, while the motors are bound. So that correlates motors that are doing the active pushing being stuck in place, at least temporarily. Um, and so filament self-propulsion we take to be uh, proportional to the local concentration of bound motors. Um, and I should mention that this work uh, was, um, was a direct outgrowth of work that Fabian was doing um, on a separate project with uh, Kinjal Daspiswas, who is also a co-author on, on this work and who spoke last week about some other things. But here's the movie. So hopefully, if it shows up well enough over Zoom, you can see, first of all, that both concentration fields are evolving. Let me play it again the orientation field tends to be along the long axis of these lanes that are forming on the left. And if we take one of, we take a snapshot from one of these movies, you can see that the concentration of the motors is um, correlated positively with the concentration of the filaments. Uh, and so the finding here is that the, with the higher motor diffusion, the motors gather in the pneumatic lanes and the lane formation is favored. So you're more likely to get these pneumatic lanes as opposed to a uniformly dense state. However, the shifting and dissolving dynamics of these active pneumatic lanes is sped up by the fact that the motors diffuse. So if the motors weren't diffusing, you have a narrower parameter space in which to get the lanes, but once you get the lanes, they stick around longer. And so there's this unintuitive um, negative feedback where lanes recruit motors and motors disperse the lanes. Uh, and experimental evidence for this was seen by um, Paresh de Mimarion and Linda Hurst's group. Um, on the left is a concentration field for filaments um, with colors overlaid for different times. On the right is uh, from the same experiments, um, but just the motors uh, being tagged here. And they have clearly aggregated in one of the main pneumatic lanes on the left. So diffusing motors can be thought of as an activity field that's coupled to the material order but with an emergent negative feedback, which was one of the interesting outcomes of this modeling. So bacterial colonies, which are the, the, which I'll talk about for the remainder of the talk, can be 
active pneumatics in the way that we were talking about for microtubules. So the movie I showed earlier was a case of this pneumatic laning with clearly non-uniform density, although there's, um, there's uh, adhesion between the cells happening here as well. Um, the scenario I'll talk about is a different one where, and one appreciated only very recently, that simply growing and dividing, but not swimming bacteria can be an active pneumatic as well. Um, and there have been a few arguments in the literature recently that um, this isn't just interesting from a liquid crystals point of view, that the bacteria, this matters for the bacteria. Um, and so the notion is if you look at a growing, say, E. coli colony um, without, their, without swimming, there's clearly an orientational order for nearby cells, but it's over some limited range. Um, and there are these discontinuities in the orientational order, similar to the microtubule sliding system I showed recently. So here the active force is only coming from growth. Uh, Dan, uh, five yes. more minutes. Oh, okay. I will speed up. So active pneumatics are known to self-mix chaotically. This is seen in the microtubule system. Uh, sorry, no, not five, uh, eight minutes. Sorry, my bad. Ah, okay, I will speed up a little bit less. <laughs> so the, um, the, the reason that uh, I found this puzzling um, that these growing active pneumatics are active pneumatics is because we think of the active pneumatic systems as undergoing this chaotic self-stirring dynamics often, um, as if uh, driven by these plus half topological defects, the U-turns, which are labeled here as, as white dots. Um, and the braiding of those around each other gives you this chaotic self-stirring. But growing bacterial colonies are known to demix in the genetic sense um, so they have been studied by several groups, including uh, David Nelson's and Oscar Halachek's groups um, as model systems for range expansions, that is a species expanding the territory it occupies. You can do this in a few days on an agar plate um, for bacteria or yeast and find that they will spontaneously segregate into different subpopulations, even without any selective advantage or disadvantage or antagonism between these subpopulations. So they coarsen as you go outward radially, which is the time axis here. So does active pneumatic mixing affect this picture? That's, that's what I want to get at here. Does physical mixing as an active pneumatic help you decrease this undesirable genetic demixing, which spontaneously reduces your genetic diversity in any one part of the colony? Dan, I will interrupt you for a minute. <clears throat> you actually have 13 minutes left. Sorry, that was a mess up. So you don't have to speed up. Just go at the speed you're going. Oh, OK. Great. <laughs> this is getting better. Sorry, right? I, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, that's it. No okay. worries. Um, good. So quick caveat. Um, <clears throat> so, so we have this um, comparison between the active pneumatic expectation of self-mixing and the population genetics perspective of growing bacterial colonies as demixing genetically. Um, these are usually studied in a slightly different context where the population genetic studies have typically assumed low nutrient availability so that the outside of the colony will quickly use up all the nutrients and the inside of the colony doesn't get to grow anymore, which means that growth is always confined to a, a slim band around the edge. Um, and this will favor a rapid gene segregation. There's a nice paper about this by um, Suzanne Cindy's group, also from UC Merced. Uh, active pneumatic behavior, on the other hand, has been typically studied in nutrient-rich conditions where we're able to assume that there's a spatially uniform growth rate enjoyed by all the cells, whether on the inside or the outside. So with that caveat, I, I will say that in this uh, paper by Barnworth Kuhn et al., uh, as well as in our simulations, which I'll show you next, um, you do still get genetic sectoring with uh, um, with nutrient rich conditions, it's just that the boundaries are fuzzier, but you have a clear, um, uh, clearly non-totally random um, uh, uh, regions of all blue or all yellow, which I'll talk about right now. Okay, so our question is, does active pneumatic self-mixing help these bacterial colonies decrease this undesirable gene segregation? If active pneumatic self-mix and growing bacterial colonies are active pneumatics, Shouldn't growing bacteri bacterial colonies chaotically self-mix and maintain this genetic diversity? 
Um, it turns out growing active pneumatics are different in some subtle ways and self-mixing hadn't been studied in them yet. There have been some really interesting simulations and um, uh, we're going to copy uh, the methods from some recent agent-based simulations uh, such as this work from Luca Giomi shown here. Um, there are also some continuum simulations which have suggested that this picture of plus half uh, this plus half defect self propulsion that we know and love from regular active pneumatics continues to be uh, an important uh, process for the growing active pneumatics. So the model here is as simple as we can make it. Um, it is these sphero cylinders or circo rectangles that are growing until they double in length, at which point they divide into two. Um, and the interactions between neighboring cells is simply steric repulsion, uh, which is um, enforced by a Hertzian uh, repulsion penalty. Uh, and so the growth is linear in time. To avoid synchronization, um, we use a range of growth rates that's just uniformly distributed over some interval. And then updates take place to the positions and the orientations of each cell through Brownian dynamics. And that's all there is to it. Um, and so as a check, um, these simulations that Fabian coded up uh, do reproduce this active pneumatic microdomain structure once the colony gets big enough. So the colors here orientation, you'll see around halfway through. Now we have all these different colors, um, but it's not pointillistic, right? There are domains of all green or all yellow, and those are domains of like pneumatic order, of like orientation. Um, the perspective, by the way, was zooming out during that movie. Um, so the cells aren't getting smaller, it's just the colony is getting bigger and we are zooming out the whole time. Okay, so we have pneumatic microdomains. That's good. That's what they see in the experiments as well. Um, so to go from there to understanding um, what the defects are doing, what, the, um, what that means for self-mixing, we smooth the discrete um, the discrete set of rod orientations and positions into continuum fields just by smearing out um, with some distribution function H, the positions as well as the pneumatic orientation tensor field along with the velocity field. And so that same movie from the last slide now looks in this coarse grained picture like this, where here you're seeing the pneumatic order which closely tracks the concentration as the colors, you're seeing red as the plus half defects and magenta as the minus half defects. So as the colony grows in size, the number of topological defect pairs grows commensurately. You can see a fair bit of motion among these defects as well. So let's try and quantify what's going on. Um, Fabian can engineer these initial conditions such that we only have one defect in isolation, which is nice because then if you look at the flow field that emerges from that, it actually does compare nicely in its vorticity to these classic now results from Luca Giomi about the flow field around a topological defect in a regular active map. That is plus half defects are these self-propelled objects with these two counter rotating vortices propelling the center of the defect forward. And here, for the uh, growing active pneumatic, the plus half defect has um, opposite signs of vorticity on the top and bottom of it, which will also uh, propel it in that same direction. Meanwhile, the minus half defects, these characteristic triangle shapes in the orientation field, have six counter rotating vortices and no net force, um, which is something we see qualitatively recapitulated in the rapidly alternating sign of vorticity in the flow field around a minus half defect. However, that's just for defects in isolation. When we look at them, um, quote unquote, in the wild, meaning in the colony as it grows, uh, the picture is more complicated because now every defects motion is also going to be affected by the radial expansion of the colony itself. And when you look at the probability distribution for the speed of motion of any one uh, defect in the orientation field, we find that the minus halves are surprisingly moving faster on average than the plus halves, which according, which uh, is not, which is the opposite of our expectation from the active pneumatic theory for a fixed volume. Uh, 
Um, and if these plus hat defects are really self-propelling, as we would expect from the fixed volume active pneumatic, then their motion should be biased in favor of the orientation direction. But that part turns out to be true, statistically at least. Um, with these two different measures, whether you're using the, um, uh, the continuum velocity field or the trajectory from frame to frame of the defect point, you find that the, um, the motion of the plus hat defect is biased in favor of its heading direction, which is the pink arrowhead shown on the right for the plus hat defect that we're considering there. And the, the red dots nearby are the minus hat defects. So plus half defect polarization um, continues to predict bias in the motion of the plus half defects, but it's a weak effect compared to the radial expansion flow. So given that, do we actually have chaotic self-mixing as we do in the fixed volume plus half, uh, the fixed volume active pneumatics, where we saw the microtubules getting chaotically mixed by the braiding motion of plus half defects? Um, and the answer turns out to be no. Uh, by I in the figure at the left, we can see that the plus half defects um, as we go forward in time from purple to yellow, um, they're mostly moving radially. So even though they do have a bias in favor of their heading direction, the net motion is pretty much just radial and they don't exhibit any uh, noticeable braiding around each other, just as the minus half defects do. Um, and so to quantify this, Fabian uh, measured the Lyapunov exponent in the uh, flow field, um, which is the maximum eigenvalue of the uh, grad V tensor. And it's statistically indistinguishable from zero for all aspect ratios of the rods for all times that he checked. Uh, and so the bottom line is there's no chaotic self-stirring in the growing active pneumatic. So while the plus half defect cell propulsion is statistically measurable, the expansion flow dominates so much that this picture of plus half defects as stirring rods mixing up our, uh, our system uh, is not a valid one for the growing active pneumatics. So that might mean there's just no mixing at all, but it turns out to be a little more subtle than that. Uh, and we found that out by applying some population genetics measures to this same system. So here, what we're going to do is assign blue or yellow randomly to each of the uh, rods at some early time, and then let the system grow. And here I'm going to show you movies for a high aspect ratio. So as it doubles in size, it goes from aspect ratio of 5 to 10, compared to low aspect ratio that goes from 1 to 2. So here's 1 to 10. And again, we're zooming out during the movie. and compare that to, on the right, this is the same movie I showed earlier. Um, so clearly there are some fuzzy boundaries in both cases, but can we quantitatively compare the mixing? One measure to uh, study the genetic mixing is the heterozygosity, which is um, the probability that two randomly selected cells have different alleles. And here, blue or yellow is the allele uh, that we're thinking about. Um, so in a fixed size, well-mixed population, this heterozygosity actually decreases exponentially in time. Um, but if you have a spatially structured population, so that is it's not efficiently, uh, it's not instantaneously mixed, essentially, then of course, how related you are to your um, uh, to different cells depends on how spatially distant you are from them. You're going to be more closely related to more nearby cells. So we're going to measure the heterozygosity in the limit of, of very near neighbors, so spatial separation going to zero. So how likely are two neighboring cells to have different alleles? This maps nicely onto the geometrical measurement of if we have the contact line between blue and yellow, um, we can just multiply that by the cell width, divide by the area of either the blue or the yellow, and that gives us the same heterozygosity. And what we find, intriguingly, is that for aspect ratios from two up to around six or seven, there is a clear increasing trend of heterozygosity with aspect ratio. That is, the systems that form a that don't form active pneumatics because their aspect ratio is too low to form any kind of orientational order, um, they have a lesser local genetic diversity 
measurably compared to the um, systems that do form active pneumatics. Another uh, measure inspired by um, population genetics is the typical number of generations separating uh, a cell, sep separating the common ancestry of cells that are nearby spatially. So if I look at any one cell and ask how many generations ago did it, did it uh, have a common ancestor in, uh, with one of the cells nearby, um, we could just track back along these growing and dividing family trees and add up the time along this path. Um, and so you find this sort of pointillistic or Van Gogh-like um, results for the low or high aspect ratios where there's clearly a lot of variation in the um, uh, in the uh, this tau bar measure, higher values are a sign of better genetic mixing. Lower values mean that the cells near you are all very closely related to you in genetic time. All right. So how does aspect ratio affect that? So of course, as time goes by, this tau bar parameter increases, but it increases slower for the lower aspect ratios. And if we just take the final time value and plot that against aspect ratio, you can see that the genetic diversity by this measure is also increasing with the increasing aspect ratio. Uh, and so the picture, the conclusion that emerges for us to this question I pose in the title, do active pneumatic self-mixing dynamics help growing bacterial colonies to maintain local genetic diversity? The answer is a surprisingly mixed one. That is um, the chaotic self-mixing that we expect from non-growing active pneumatics doesn't occur here. The plus half defects do self-propel, but it's such a weak effect compared to the radial expansion that it doesn't give you any chaotic self-mixing. And yet, um, if you look at the genetic measures of genetic mixing, it does seem that the uh, high aspect ratio active pneumatic systems are able to slow down the process of genetic demixing compared to the low aspect ratio active isotropic systems. Uh, and so this was all for this very simplest case of the um, neutral evolution, so no selective advantage or disadvantage. We didn't allow any mutation um, between blue and yellow. We didn't allow um, any difference in growth rates depending on, say, some other field of nutrients. And we didn't allow cell death. All of those are realistic factors to add into this kind of model uh, and study them in a, a physical mechanical context as they've been studied in a somewhat more abstract population genetics context. So we think there's a lot of, of um, interesting room for future work there. Um, let me. Uh, Thank, of course, my group members, um, including Maravanti, Jane, and Jimmy, the grad students, Andre, uh, postdoc, and Fabian, whose uh, work was what I showed you today, as well as our wonderful collaborators and NSF and UC Merced for funding. Um, and really quickly, let me give an advertisement uh, for our SLAM uh, seminars. So if you happen to enjoy online research talks about biological and soft matter physics, you may enjoy um, this online seminar series that is co-organized uh, by Kinjal Daspiswas, Sarad Shankar, and myself. Um, these are research talks on soft living, active and adaptive matter um, construed broadly uh, and given by postdocs exclusively. So we're looking for those rising stars in the field. And if you want to nominate someone or self-nominate, we are always looking for great speakers. Um, and there is a session for just the grad students to interact with the speaker at the end. This is every second Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific time, and we have one coming up uh, this coming Monday of uh, Eisen Yuen. So please go to physics.ucmerced.edu slash slam if you are interested in signing up for the mailing list. So let me come back to my summary here. Um, thank you all very much uh, for hearing this talk, and I'll be happy to take questions. Um, great. Uh, thank you, Dan, for uh, the beautiful talk. Sorry for the confusion with the timing. That's okay. Um, um, let's see. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat, but we have a raised hand. Um, Andre, uh, Maxime, would you like to ask a question? Yes, sure. Thank you very much for this uh, nice talk. Uh, I've learned many things. Um, there is uh, one thing in uh, morphog morphogenesis of uh, micro microcolonies that uh, we showed is very important. That's work I've done with uh, Nicolas Despra uh, in Paris. Uh, 
um, he showed that uh, the adhesions of the cell to the substrate is actually ruling the, the morphogenesis of, uh, of the colony because when cells divide, they elongate like that. But when the septum is cut, the adhesion at the pole makes them buck, uh, uh, make them doing a, a buckling uh, uh, phenomenon. So mm -hmm. they elongate and then look, they goes like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something uh, he, he's got in a paper uh, with, uh, with me and uh, Marie-Cécile Duvernois. And I was wondering, so if you add in your model, uh, so, some phenomenon that Addison is actually rearranging uh, the cells to do like that once they divide. What does it change uh, in the in, in your microcolonies? And it, I, I never thought uh, microcolonies formation as something to mix uh, genotype. I think it's a super cool idea. Uh, so I, I'm really curious to know what can happen uh, if you add this ingredient. Um, so thank you for the question, um, and I'm intrigued to learn more about that work. Let me first play this movie again, and then ask you if this at all matches what you're talking about. Yeah, I was I was shocked actually because you know in our Sorry, experiment and in, in our description, like you never see a, a chain of bacteria. Okay, okay, maybe you've got another strain. So 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 at some yeah, point here there is a buckling. So what happens? So, so um, this, is, this will happen at some time uh, because you have the friction pushing back against you. It, it may be that at the very beginning, there was just enough synchronization in the growth rates that, um, or, or this symmetry wasn't properly broken. You know, sometimes if your initial conditions impose too much symmetry, then it, it takes longer than it should for the computer to break that symmetry in the simulation. So maybe that's something for us to vary, um, but at least qualitatively, it sounds like after a couple of generations, we do have um, this buckling effect where you get these strong overlaps um, and we don't assume any, anything in particular about adhesion. Um, there's simply um, a friction dominated uh, um, physics assumption that goes into using Brownian dynamics as opposed to um, more general Langevin molecular dynamics. Um, so I'm wondering if that's enough or if we should, I mean, we certainly could look at attractive forces between neighbors um, specifically. Yeah, what we showed is that there is some addition factor which are localized at the pole. Mm. So it creates a force to, to the two bacteria next to each other mm -hmm. to make the buckling. And this, this also happens within the micro colonies when it's a, a bit uh, big, you know, if you are have uh, some neighbors which surround you, you still have this buckling which happens. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I'm very curious to see if you add this uh, addition at the pole, uh, how the mixing is going to to happen uh, then. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll drop yes, you mail to just give you the, the the paper and you can have a yeah. look. At, uh, Thank you. Uh, I'm interested to read more. Thank you. Topic. Um, so yeah. let's ask, uh, we have uh, two more questions quickly. Um, so uh, we have a question from Bekele uh, Gourmesa. Uh, she's always uh, impressed with the microtubule defect propagations. Uh, can you comment on what causes the defect formations in the microtubules? Uh, right, so um, let me go back to that. Uh, um, this is a, the system dom, um, uh, pioneered by the Dojic lab here is actually Linda Hurst group along with Kevin Mitchell's uh, um, quantifying chaotic mixing in it. So why do you get these defects? This was actually um, predicted uh, long before it was seen experimentally, um, predicted by uh, Simha and Ramaswamy from the fact that um, just based on symmetries and local uh, active force generation. If you have a tendency to align, but also a tendency to push outwards, um, then you will of course get a local alignment, but it turns out that can't be extended through the whole system. There's a characteristic length scale that emerges from a comparison between active force generation and elasticity, which will tend to straighten things out locally. That length scale uh, manifests as the typical spacing between these topological defects, 
which because our system has pneumatic symmetry, that is head-tail symmetry, are going to generically be the um, so-called elementary topological charges of a 2D pneumatic system, which are the plus half U-turn and the minus half triangle. Okay, we have uh, one last question from Kimberly. Uh, did you look at systems with significant shape polydispersity? different aspect ratios. How do you expect this to affect um, the self-mixing? Uh, that, that is a wonderful question. We, we definitely have not looked at that. And I would add that to the long list of, of biologically relevant complications to add into this model now that we've looked at the very simplest case. Um, in, in particular, um, I, I think that can go well with other questions where you have um, two subpopulations which start well mixed, and maybe one is better adapted for the environment it starts out in, um, but maybe the environment will change later. And if you're thinking of this colony as, as wanting to stay robust against changes in the environment in some evolutionary uh, metaphorical sense, does it help to mix the long and the short or otherwise advantageous and disadvantageous uh, subpopulations together or let them uh, segregate through these uh, sort of low number statistics fluctuations as they would do without mixing? Uh, it's a great question to explore. Um, great. So um, we can open the discussion.